Today we're going to be discussing the thought of Iris Murdoch, specifically with reference to her novel Under the Net. Uh, Iris Murdoch, as we'll see, is a, a significant philosopher, in fact, one of my own philosophical heroes. And she also is a brilliant writer and wrote a number of award winning novels. Um, she was born in 1919, as you can see here, just after the First World War. Uh, died in 1999, so her life spanned most of the 20th century. Uh, I want to back up a little bit and think about existentialism, because in part, I see Iris Murdoch as reacting against existentialism. Uh, remember Camus talking about the absurd. He said his goal was to live without a being. What did the banana say to the grapefruit? My goal is to live without a being. Okay, it's a terrible joke. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this goal to live without a being. We create our own meaning is the idea. All of this meaning is there, not in the world, but inside us. So the very kind of thing that Hume did by saying, well, the source of the ought is not out there in the world, it's something within me. This is something the existentialists take to an extreme conclusion. The meaning of life, the meaning of anything, the significance of the world, the ought, the good, the bad, all of that really comes from just within. It is all coming from inside us. We create our own meanings. In fact, we're free to create our own meaning however we want. There isn't any outside authority. There isn't any standard. There isn't any meaning that is already given. Nothing really has an essence that is established independently of us. And so Kabu says, I draw from this three consequences. They are my revolt, my freedom, and my passion. My Freedom, because I realize I am absolutely free now to define me however I want. My revolt, because I realize to the extent that I'm doing that, I'm actually doing something that goes beyond what the world gives me. In fact, it's to some extent in defiance of what the world gives me. The world presents me an absurd, meaningless set of circumstances, and I have to transform them into something meaningful. And so in doing that, I'm in a sense rebelling against the utter lack of meaning, the utter lack of essence, the utter lack of structure in the world. And then my passion, because I recognize this is mine. It is something I am creating. And so in a sense, all meaning, all value, I recognize now as mine. Not as something foreign to me, imposed on me, not as some kind of external constraint, but instead as something that I embrace. I am the author of my own meaning, the author of my own life, the author of my own values. And so I recognize this is fully mine, and I can be passionate about things in a way that thinks I really couldn't be otherwise if I viewed the source of any of this as outside myself. But now, about this, I'm going to raise Dostoevsky's question once again. If all value, all meaning is coming from the self, then don't I end up in a position of narcissism? Am I not really in the end just admiring myself? And my passion is really just a passion for me? Doesn't this lead to something like a self-love or a self-admiration, where at the end, really, it's kind of an empty sort of existence? Now, you might think that it's going to be hard for an existentialist to do certain things. After all, if everything is really something that I am imposing, if there are no external constraints on me, but it's all a question of being authentic to what I want, what I choose, then certain things are going to be easy for me as an existentialist. What are things might be hard for me? What could be hard for me if I really don't recognize the legitimacy of any external constraints? Following rules. Yeah, the university says you want to graduate, you have to take this course and this course. And I say, oh, I have find my own name. I have find my own person. <laughs> Well, maybe I'm graduating that way. No, actually, I think it's a great idea, by the way. If I could reform universities in one way, I'd just say eliminate all requirements. Just say, you know, to get a degree from UT, maybe you have to major in something and you have to accumulate 120 hours. The end. Then do whatever you want. But then again, yeah, I, that's a very existential thing, I suppose. Um, that way, you really could define your own need. But the way it is now, you can't really do that. Other things that might be difficult for you. Well, let's look at the life of Camus a little bit. Here are some letters that he wrote all in a single day in 1959. Okay, he's writing to his mistress, announcing that he would shortly be returning to Paris from Longueuil, where he'd spent the summer with his wife and children. <laughs> this frightful separation will at least have made us feel more than ever constant need we have for each other. The same day, oh, actually, sorry, 
the next day, he wrote, just to let you know I'm arriving on Tuesday in my car. I'm so happy at the idea of seeing you again, but I'm laughing as I write. A day later, see you Tuesday, my dear, I'm kissing you already and bless you from the bottom of my heart. Then, that same day, another letter, setting up a date in New York. They were all to different women. <laughs> okay? Now, here is, he was linked romantically to many different women throughout his life. Here's one, here's one. There's two. <laughs> I love the experiment of faith in the eyes, like, <laughs> uh, here's one, yes, another, and another, and another, and another. Well, you get the idea, it's been talking for a while. <laughs> now, okay, well, yes, <laughs> um, commitment, you might think, is not something that a existentialist are big on. After all, it's, it's all about my revolt, my freedom, my passion. You might think it's not just external rules, following rules, following laws, and things like that that are going to be a problem for me. Keeping any kind of commitment is going to be a problem for me. After all, I'm yeah, committed only to the extent that I choose to be, right? And so, actually, the same was true of Jean Paul Sartre. Um, he had many different affairs, and, well, all right, that's one way to live in a certain department of your life, but actually, you might think there's a very general moral to this which is that for an existentialist to be constant, <laughs> to be faithful to a partner, but also quite generally to keep commitments to actually sort of be faithful to any long-term project, what's the difference, right? Whether you choose small things or large things. And I think that's part of what we see going on in Other Than That. So let me back up a little and talk about Iris Murdoch. Iris Murdoch was born in Dublin. She worked for a while when she was young for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. But then she became a philosophy fellow at St. Anne's College in Oxford. She taught at Oxford for most of her career in the philosophy department. And she wrote many important works of philosophy, like The Sovereignty of Good, or this book, Metaphysics as a Guide to Morals. But she was mostly known as a novelist, who wrote a number of things, The Sea, The Sea, Under the Net, a variety of other books that were award-winning and gained considerable popularity. In the end, she published 25 books, mostly fiction. And you can see from some of these photographs a bit of what she was like. She is a uh, sort of, uh, well, what? Stern, Oxford figure, but not entirely. Here she's playing with some birds. <laughs> there she's looking sort of, uh, well, I don't know, quizzically at that statue. <laughs> In any case, under the net is a book that I think has many of her most important philosophical themes built into it. Now, some of you said you found it difficult to actually discern philosophical themes in this book, I find that very surprising, partly because of the very first paragraph, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, philosophy is sort of infused throughout this book. In fact, the difficulty of identifying themes is really that there are so many tossed about so literally that it can be hard to really see much continuity in this. Uh, and actually, her, some of her philosophical work is that way too. This book is sort of like what Iris Murdoch thought about everything as she was in the last years of her life and had one last, last chance to reflect. So it goes from all sorts of topics, over all sorts of topics, from one thinker to another. And uh, the book is a little, the novel is a little bit like that too. Anyway, what are some themes you identified in the book? Yeah? Like truth and lying? Truth and lying. <laughs> yeah, good, exactly. What is the real truth? And are we condemned, you might say, to lie? to other people and to ourselves, is that ever really possible to tell the truth? What would the truth even be if we could tell? That is a theme, as we'll see, that runs through the book. Are there some others? Yeah. Destiny. Destiny, fate, yes, exactly. Uh, there's a related theme of mystery. Certain things are referred to as mysteries or one of the wonders of the world. His friend Dave, the philosopher, he says, you know, he's a real philosopher like Dave Carter, huh? which means he never had any money. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, he, He's referred to as somebody who thinks that the world contains all these mysteries, but then it is possible to find the key. And so, is it possible to understand our own fate, our own destiny? What does that mean for us? And also, are there things that really have a structure in the world? Uh, does the world have this kind of built-in nature? Um, is it a mystery for us? Are there just wonders of the world? Or are there things that we can understand? Um, notice the very end of the book, by the way, one of my favorite passages, because it's about cats. Uh, Maggie the cat is finally had her kittens. And Mrs. Tate says, yeah, I don't know why these two appear Siamese, and the other ones are quite different. Um, 
said they're all being half caddy and half side bees. And he said, well, that's how it always is. It's quite simple. Why is it that it's a business take? Well, I said, it's just a matter of. I stopped. I had no idea what it was a matter of. I laughed, but this is Tim and laughed. I don't know why it is, I said. It's just one of the wonders of the world. That's how the book ends. But yes, there are certain things here that are, it's in black, just wonders of the world. So fate, destiny, wonders, mystery, all of that is sort of bound up together in a series of things that are related to each other, I think. Other things. Yeah. Language and time. Good, language. Language runs throughout this as a theme. In fact, the title, Under the Net. What is the net? Really, language, yeah. And to some extent, thought, too. I mean, it's a question of whether we can get at reality under this net of language, under the net that our thinking imposes on things. And so the idea of language, thought, um, those things run throughout the book. Other things, yeah. Realism, absolutely. Is it possible to actually come into contact with a mind-independent world? Is the world really independent of us, first of all? And secondly, if it is, is it possible for us to actually gain some kind of access to it? Or is it forever screened off by this net of language and concepts? Existentialism. Okay, good. I like to see this book as, in part, a critique of existentialism. She's playing with existentialist themes, and they emerge in various ways, but I think in the end you're supposed to reject them. And something dramatic happens in the last few pages, which is really the core of the positive idea, and the core of the rejection of that. Other ideas, yeah. Love. Love, good. Love is something that runs throughout this. The possibility of love, the impossibility, at least for certain kinds of people, of love. Yeah, um, it's one of the things that I use <laughs> the example of Camus and his affairs to try to motivate. Uh, can an existentialist truly love? Can the existentialist truly value love of a person as an independent person in their own right? It is, to some extent, I think, an open question. It's something you should wonder about, given the book. Other ideas, yeah? Uh, just relationships in general and social capital. Good, okay, good. Relationships and social capital. Yeah, is, I mean, if you just say, relationships are the theme, yeah, the way they are, but for a paper, you should sort of say something a little bit more philosophical. By the way, some of you said draft to me, and the typical problem with a draft was really just that you talk about Jake's character, which is fine as a beginning, and that's going to be a lot of your evidence, but you need to then spin it into something more general. But yet there's a lot to say about human relationships, it's quite general. Are they even possible? Is it possible for two people to really communicate to one another? Is it possible for two people to really know one another? And so that kind of thing is an important theme for the book because it seems like love is this elusive thing. At one point, J.K. Fax says, it's like a regulative ideal rather than a constitutive part of my life. That's a, a sly reference to Immanuel Kant, but in part he's saying it's like they're an ideal that you can strive for, we can never actually attain. And so the question of whether it's ever truly possible to love, ever truly possible to communicate, to actually know another person, all of those, I think, are important themes. Other ideas. Yeah. Perspectivity. Perspectives and perspectives. Yeah. Different people here have very different perspectives. And it's quite jarring, right? Because it turns out Jake has all these ideas of people, and then you find out the other person's perspective is completely different. Like he thinks he's stolen all of Hugo's ideas, and he's very ashamed, right? He's thinking Hugo's going to hate him because he stole the ideas and published them, and then Hugo turns out read the book to publish great and didn't recognize any of those ideas as well. It wasn't bad at all. It's like, what? Wait, you talking about that stuff? God, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> and that's just one of the places where you see the dramatic differences in perspectives. Other things. Yeah. Oh, Pirinello's masks and existentialism. Okay, good. The existentialist thinks in terms of you know, these occasional confrontations with the absurd, where, as Pirinello would put it, the mask slips. Or the existentialist might say, when we confront these absurd walls, when we suddenly see something out of extraordinary context, and we start thinking about it, and it appears strange to us, and we recognize this utter lack of meaning and lack of essence that it has, and you're right, there are certain occasions here where they're just confrontations with absurdity. In fact, part of what makes the book so funny are those confrontations with absurdity. And I hope you see it's funny. I mean, existentialist books aren't usually funny. Uh, Jean-Paul Jean Sartre, for example, has a novel called Nausea, in which the character is frequently nauseous. 
And it's, let me tell you, it's not very funny. Uh, in the very first iteration of what became this course, back in 1984, to introduce existentialism, I had people read nausea. And it's not a lot of fun. I mean, it does communicate a lot of uh, existentialist ideas. But this whole history is supposed to be fun. And so here, the confrontations with the observed places where the mass slips are partly upsetting their characters to shock me, but partly they're ridiculous and the reader should be laughing at them. And so that already tells you, yes, there's that theme there, and yet the Murdoch's attitude about it is rather different from that of the standard existentialist. You see something quite different going on there. Other themes. Yeah. Idealism. Idealism. Okay, good. Someone met, earlier mentioned realism. And so that conflict between realism and idealism, to what extent we really are confronted with a world of our own making, as the existentialist seems to think, or to what extent we are given a world that is really independent of us. Uh, in fact, from that point of view, you might think of realism and idealism as endpoints on a scale. <laughs> I suppose as long as you think that anything is mind independent, you are a realist of some kind. But there's one dimension where it's like, how much is really independent of us? Uh, meaning and value and things like that, the existentialists say, are not independent of us. Um, is there anything about the world that's independent of us? That's one question. But then, if things are independent or dependent, you might think there are degrees of independence or dependence. And so there's a second dimension where one might ask that question. And so that conflict between the realist and the idealist is something that, in a sense, bubbles throughout the book and keeps popping up at certain points. Other ideas about themes? Yes. Uh, silence and self-discovery. Good. Science and self-discovery. Yes. Uh, at one point, in fact, there's a crucial thing. We can tell the truth only in science. And so the idea of science runs throughout here as an interesting theme. Um, if, after all, the reality is in some sense hidden from us by this net of language of concepts of thought, then actually you might think it's really only when we stop thinking, only when we stop speaking, <laughs> that we're actually capable of appreciating. That's a theme that is common to Zen Buddhism, for example. And Buddhism is something that Murdoch occasionally does write about and think about. And so there is, I think, that theme of silence here. And whether it's only in silence that one actually sees the true nature of things. And then also the question of self-discovery. Is it possible for us to know other people, we ask? Well, is it possible for us to know our, ourselves? Do we end up lying inevitably even to ourselves? And so I think those are important themes, too. Well, let me talk about some of the themes as I saw them going through the book. Um, Here's one quotation that isn't from the book, but expresses, I think, a common theme to a number of things that Murdoch wrote. We live in a fantasy world, a world of illusion. The great task in life is to find reality. And so, if that's the idea, that in a sense, she thinks of this question about language, about thought, and also about the contrast between realism and idealism as central to what not only this novel, but all of her work is really about. It's a question of, we create these worlds for ourselves, is it possible for us to ever get outside of them? To actually communicate with another person, to love another person, to ever actually see the world as it is, to ever actually find reality, as she puts it here. Now, let's take a look at that first paragraph. One of you said, I don't see anything philosophical in this book. And I said, read the first paragraph. <laughs> okay, and indeed, look at the very first paragraph. It goes on a little bit before this. But then we get to this part. The invigorating objectivity of true contemplation is something which a man of my temperament cannot achieve in unfamiliar towns in England. Now, let's stop right here. The invigorating objectivity of true contemplation. Two things right there. Objectivity. Is objectivity possible? Or are we always trapped without our own subjective view of the world? And then, the nature of true contemplation. The idea of silence, contemplation, meditation, reflection is something that runs throughout the book as well. And so two major themes are already there in the first paragraph. But then it goes on, even when he is not also to be worried about trains. <laughs> trains are bad for the nerves at the best of times. What did people have nightmares about before there were trains? That's supposed to be funny. Okay? Now, I, when I read into this discussion section, too, they were just kind of... <laughs> but it's funny, right? Or at least it's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be fake ridiculous. Have you ever had a nightmare about a train? Well, neither have I. I've been in lots of trains. And so, you might think, look, uh, this is ridiculous, right? So already in the first paragraph, you should recognize, say, some kind of novel. Okay? <laughs> uh, 
there's something really weird about this guy, and you should already be sort of laughing at it. That's something that the existentialists don't let you do very often. Camus the stranger involves a guy who just randomly kills another person and then is on death row. It's not a lot of fun. The play is about play. Not a lot of fun. <laughs> Zart's nausea. Blech. But here, the first, by the end of the first paragraph, you should really be already laughing at the characters. Now, we talked some about the theme of truth. In fact, that's the very first theme you all mentioned. So let's look at that. The movement away from theory and generality is the movement toward truth. This is Hugo speaking, actually. All of theorizing is flat. We must be ruled by the situation itself. And this is unutterably particular. So here we get a contrast between the universality of language and thought and then the unutterable particularity of an individual situation. Can we really theorize and capture anything about the world? Or does language, does thought, does the intellectual activity of trying to understand anything actually distance us from the world? Here is, I think, what's going on in the background. Language and thought are universal. And what I mean by that is that anything <laughs> that we use as a term in language or in thought could apply to infinitely many things. Suppose, for example, I said, ah, oh, this is a book. Consider the word book. It divides the world into books and non-books. And how many things do count as a book? Infinitely many things, right? I mean, there are only finitely many that have actually ever been produced by any human being. But Borges, in one of his stories about the Library of Babel, imagines that we've got a library that contains all possible words. Here's the very first one. Oh, just one letter, A. I suppose there could be a John Cage type book which just has nothing written in it at all. In fact, there was a book like that. What? Who was the politician? It's been since repeated with other politicians, but I think it was originally Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew. Anyway, it was a book publisher called The Wit and Wisdom of Spiro Agnew. You opened it up a couple pages of it's black. Uh, but it didn't have a title. The perfect example would be just no title, nothing in the page, just black, right? Uh, anyway, I guess well, that's in the library table. But then you've got A, and then B, and, you know, and then you start stringing things together, and all possible books are there in this library. That's the idea. Well, all right, you could do that. And all of those infinitely many things would count as books. But now, objects, events, and people are there is something about each one of us, about every individual object in the world, that lies beyond this power of language. You might say, take a bunch of universals together. Can you ever really get the full nature of a particular circumstance or person or thing? And the answer here seems to be no. And so, language, the thought, how can it actually describe reality accurately? It's given the task of describing something that is particular. That is, in a sense, I think Murdoch thinks infinitely complicated. And yet you've got a language that is really just this large scale net. And it's something that is like this, it's trying to do these things that capture oh, really infinitely many things when we want to capture this one thing. And so here's a place where the title actually appears in the book. Indeed, it's something to which we can never get close enough. However hard we may try, as it were, to crawl into the net. And she sees that as, in a sense, what we're trying to do in life. Crawl under the net and see the world as it is. Crawl under the net and find reality. And it's what thinking and language and concepts actually seem to make harder for us rather than easier. Hegel says that the truth is a great word. <laughs> and the thing is greater still. With Dave, this philosophical friend, we never seem to get past the word, so finally I gave up. In short, this, this philosopher he knows, and, and probably this is the way Murdoch felt about many of her colleagues at Oxford University, actually. They were just focused on the word. In fact, at the time, the dominant school of philosophy in England, which was centered at Oxford, was ordinary language philosophy. Just worry about how people talk. And that was not her view at all. In fact, thinking about how people talk doesn't tell you about the nature of reality. If anything, it distances you from it. So language. The word here is, again, in the voice of Hugo, things are falsified from the start. As soon as I start to describe, I'm done for. The language just won't let you present it as a really was. Suppose later you try to tell people what it was like to be in this class. You're saying, oh yes, I took this course. And somebody says, you studied with a great <laughs> All right, we're in a very distant possible world here. But somebody asks you that, and they ask you, tell me what it was like. Well, how do you begin to tell what it was like? 
It was something that is entirely particular, and language seems inadequate to the task. Maybe you can do better if you can actually show someone what it is like. And in fact, actually, that's part of the reason I make these videos, so that people will have a record of what it was like that's more intimate than just reading about it or hearing about it or something like that. I think about the great thinkers of the past century who are sort of lost in the distance of time. Uh, imagine being able to study physics with Einstein, or philosophy with Russell, or Wittgenstein, or Carnap, uh, or mathematics with some of the great thinkers of the 20th century, uh, Borel, let's say, and others, and, or Gödel, and then think, but all that's lost, right? Maybe somebody still so well wrote about it who was in their classes and could tell you what that was like, but you can't see it yourself. Well, that sort of attempt to describe something and finding words inadequate to the past is what Hugo's pointing out. Maybe we can never really do it. We can never really tell somebody what something was like. If I spoke now, there's always the danger of my telling the truth, Jake says right there at the beginning. When caught on the wares, I usually tell the truth. And what's duller than that? <laughs> so we get this theme of lying introduced. At this rate, almost everything one says turns out to be a sort of lie. Hugo ponders this. I think it is so, he said with seriousness. In that case, one well, ought to talk, I said. I think perhaps one well, ought to, said Hugo, oh, and he was deadly serious. Then I caught his eye, and we both laughed enormously, thinking how we had been doing nothing else for days on end. But indeed, later this theme comes back. The whole language is a machine for making falsehoods. So we never really communicate? Well, he says, I suppose actions don't lie. But later, Jake rejects even that. Says, is the truth that actions don't lie? Then he thinks about some actions that are actually highly ambiguous. He's not sure how to interpret them. And he says, yes, even through actions, even by seeing the thing itself, we really can never quite get at the truth. So these themes of lying, the possibility of truth, the possibility of communication, are all significant here. What is the truth? Well, in the end, truth lies in blundering a lot. <laughs> and near the end, Jake says, oh, that's a hell of truth, I told him. Actions don't lie, words always do. But now I see that this was all a hallucination. So for a while, we get that thought. It's only by you know, looking at the action itself directly that you can actually see the, the truth, describing it, trying to understand it, all of that leads you away. And yet, even by the end, he rejects that. It's not clear, by the way, which half of this is being rejected. Is it that he's rejecting the thought that world, words always lie, or is he rejecting the thought that actions don't lie? Maybe they both lie. Well, then the theme of silence. So, in the end, truth can be attained, if at all, only in silence. There's a reference here to one of Murdoch's philosophical heroes, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who in 1921 published his doctoral dissertation, actually, on Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. It's usually now called the Tractatus. Um, it's numbered propositions, there's like no explanation <laughs> of anything. It's a very abstract sort of work. And it closes with a seventh proposition, which is this. That which cannot be said must be passed over in silence. Now, for Wittgenstein, that included, well, norms of all kinds. It included ethics, it included politics, it included meaning, and here I mean semantic meaning of words, as well as the meaning of life or the meaning of actions. Really, anything involving practical affairs, all of that was something language was completely inadequate to describe. And so Wittgenstein was trying to delineate a realm within which language actually worked, but then a realm within which it didn't work at all. Things had to be passed over in silence. From his point of view, that included everything that was really most of their in life. Here, by the way, is a picture of Wittgenstein in front of a blackboard. And it illustrates the point that anyway, I'm trying to explain we're trying to describe that picture. How can we do that in words? I just did it. Make him sign in front of black. <laughs> but that seems really inadequate to describe that. How can you describe that in a way that would, you know, suppose you have a friend who's blind and can't see it, but you're trying to describe it. How can you do that? Is language at all accurate to words? That's something that I think is really bothering for. Now, you talked about the distinction between realism and idealism. There's a lot of that here, too. There's, here's a, one of those sort of throwaway passages at one point in the book. There's something compelling about the sound of a fountain in a deserted place. It murmurs about what things do when no one watches them. It's the hearing of an unheard sound. We talked about that, you know, those, when a tree falls in the forest question, a gentle reputation of heart. Now, what is she doing? 
a gentle refutation of Marx. How does the fountain refute it? Good, it exists even though nobody's watching it. Right? It's in, that's why it's important that it's a deserted place. You come upon this place, nobody else is around, and there's this sound. And it's bubbling, it's making this sound. In fact, when I said philosophical things bubble up in the book, I had this passage in mind. The fountain is there bubbling, flowing, and you think, wow, that was here, it was doing this thing before I arrived. It'll do it after I leave. The doing of it is in no way dependent on somebody else being here to observe it. And so the idea is, look, it has its own, it's doing its own thing. It has its own independent pattern, its own independent existence. And so that's the sense in which this is a gentle refutation of art. Not like Samuel Johnson kicking the stone. This is rather something that just quietly tells you, look, I exist whether you do or not. Now, the theme of reflections, of contemplation, meditation, but also reflections in a more ordinary sense. That goes throughout the book. That was just what was yours, I said. It was you reflected in Anna, just as that dialogue was you reflected in me. And then Hugo responds by saying, I don't recognize the reflection. So here, in a way, all of our understandings are thought, well, I can't say that. Maybe it's just Jake. Maybe it's just these weird people. In a sense, this book is a book about a bunch of British losers. <laughs> and so you might think, yeah, gosh, why, why are we reading this at all? But part of what's intriguing here is that sort of question. When I think I communicated with somebody else, when I think I understand something, do I mean, or is it, am I just dealing with that reflection of that person in me in some way? Maybe that's all that ever happens. You would just have some reflection of me, some image of me in your mind, and I have images of you with these reflections. Maybe they don't, they don't match what we really are at all. Hugo says, I don't recognize the reflections. His impression of Jake, of Anna, of everybody else in the story really isn't like Jake's at all. Now, that's part of what intrigues Jake about Hugo. He seems to be somebody who's free from all this, who doesn't actually have these reflections. He, Hugo, was a man without claims and without reflections. Okay, you, this should remind you of an existentialist theme, right? Living without appeal. Hugo, he's saying, is somebody like that, who actually sort of lives without appeal. Why can I pursue it? He had nothing to tell me. And so in the end, Jake backs away from this, thinking of Hugo as this wise man, this hero. And then finally he gets there and says, wait a minute, there weren't really any. All of this was in mind, it wasn't in him at all. And suddenly he backs away saying, I have nothing more to learn from him. Well, that idea of reflections is actually something that runs through the book in subtle ways too. There's all this stuff about mirrors. For example, Dave, the philosopher, was writing an article from mine which remains, by the way, one of the big three journals in philosophy. It's the one that's rich. On the incongruity of categories. He had been working for some time on the article, which he wrote sitting in front of a mirror, and alternately staring at his reflection and examining his two hands. He had several times tried to explain to me his solution, but I had not yet so got so far as grasping the problem. But in a way, can we grasp the problem? It's like, what's the relationship between my hand and that hand in the mirror? What's the relationship between the reality and then these reflections. The reflection in a mirror, well, she's dismissing that as a basically trivial question. But the reflection in people's minds, that's not so trivial. Is the image, I mean, don't, we don't have that closer relationship. So in this sense, it doesn't matter exactly whether our images of one another match. But think about your relationship with somebody who's really close to you. Does that person's image of you at all match who you really are? That should match you. And that, in a sense, is the question what is the relationship between that reflection and the thing itself? What if there really is a basic incongruity? That is to say, they never really fit together. There's something like the hand and the reflection of that hand, which is always sort of backwards. After all, you see yourself in a mirror, right? You're never seeing yourself the way you did look, because the mirror is reversing right and left. You're seeing the mirror image of yourself. That's why in a photograph, it's sort of jarring, and you think, I look like that. Because it's the, you know, it's the it's your version flipped. Now with Photoshop and things like that, you can actually do even in preview or something like that. You can do this, right? In Adobe, you can flip the image, just flip horizontal, um, and then it's like, oh, that should match the way you see yourself in the mirror. But that's why this, in a sense, comes up already. The mirror is already falsifying what other people are really seeing. Well, there's another theme that emerges, and I think it points toward what 
I see as the central of the book. There are a bunch of shadows in the book. Here's one example. He starts realizing the business of my life lay elsewhere. There was a path which awaited me, in which if I failed to take it, would lie untrodden forever. How much longer would I delay? This was the substance, and all other things were shadows, fit only to distract the sea. And so he starts recognizing that, wait a minute, I do have a destiny. I do have a purpose. I actually have something which is essential to me. And these other things are just shadows. They aren't the real thing. This other thing is real. Near the, end of the, near the beginning of the book, he's given up on all that, right? He has no ideals. In fact, he refers to an epic uh, that he started writing, and then that his girlfriend had torn apart in a fit of rage. He says, yeah, that dated from the time when I had uh, ideals. At that time, too, it had not yet become clear to me that the present age was not one in which it was possible to write in that epic. Why? Because nobody believes in anything. Because nobody has any conception of what a great accomplishment, what a great adventure would really be. Indeed, our lives seem to be filled with all these things that aren't great adventures at all. All of these passing, ephemeral, sort of disappearing events. I felt neither happy nor sad, only rather unreal, like a man shot in a glass. Events streaming past us like these crowds, and the face of each is seen only for a minute. What's urgent is not urgent forever, but only ephemerally. All of work and all love, the search for wealth and fame, the search for truth, like itself, are made up of moments which pass and become nothing. And so Jake at one point here is saying, look, it looks like all these things that people care about, what difference does it make really? I mean, in a hundred years, in a thousand years, what will anything you do matter? How will your life make any difference at all to anything? You might think it wouldn't. But then he gets this realization. Through this shaft of nothings, we drive onward with that miraculous vitality that creates our precarious habitations in the past and the future. So we live a spirit that broods and hovers over the continual death of time, the lost meaning, the unrecaptured moment, the unremembered face, until the final chop that ends all our moments and plunges the spirit back into the void from which it came. That idea, the unrecaptured moment, the unremembered face, um, it reminds me of it of Wordsworth in lines composed of love, tinter, and Abbey, that best part of a good man's life, the unremembered acts of kindness and of love, the things that are, yes, ephemeral, unremembered, and yet, are actually the fabric of life that give it a sort of meaning. And so, relationships, we've talked some about the difficulty of those, but you might say, look, we live in the interstices, <laughs> how do you pronounce that word? Interstices of each other's lives, and we would all get surprised if we could see everything. We live in these little shadows, these little corners, these little empty spots in the corners of people's lives, and we're just reflected there. We never really quite know each other, but then something near the end happens. A lot of you, I think, wrote about Jake the way he did for most of the book. But at the end, there is at least the appearance of this transformation. And suddenly, he sees something differently. Anna, for example, he said, it seemed as if for the first time, Anna really existed. Now as a separate being, and not just as a part of myself. To experience this was extremely painful. When does one ever know a human being? Here, it's partly that question of knowledge, but partly a question of recognizing another person as really a person in themselves, in Kantian terms, as an end of themselves, really as you, just a, rather than just as a means to your own ends. And for the first time, he's seeing someone else, not just as a mean to his end, but as an independent being with real significance. Well, yeah, I'm actually a lot of talk about this, because he says, yeah, in the end, it's really these details that make up the significance of life. Every man must have a training. Yours, this is Hugo talking to Jake, is right. Mine will be making and mending watches, I hope, if I'm good enough. And what about the truth, I said wildly? What about the search for God? What more do you want, said Hugo? God is a task. God is detail. It all lies close to you. And so in the end, the meaning of it all is already right there. It's not something you have to make up. It's not something you have to impose on the world. It's there, but it's in the details. It's not in the grand epic. It's in the little stuff. So he starts and turns toward his own work. And something very dramatic happens near the end. He says, there will be no more translating. So he's no longer just going to be talking about other people's ideas and expressing other people's thoughts. Instead, he says, and he begins up to undo the parcel of manuscripts so of his old writings. I spread them out on the table. And as I touch them, my hands were trembling, like the hands of a water diviner. I began to glance through them, looking with surprise at what I had done. There was a long poem, a fragment of a novel, a number of curious stories. It seemed to me that I had written them long ago. 
These things were mediocre, I saw it. But I saw it too as it were straight through them. Not straight through them. It's as if he's getting under the net for the first time. The possibility of doing better. And this possibility was present to me as a strength which cast me lower and raised me higher than I had ever been before. I took out Hugo's copy of The Silencer, that book he had written, on the basis of those conversations. And the sight gave me joy. This too was only a beginning. It was the first day of the world. I was full of that strength, which is better than happiness. Better than the weak wish for happiness, which women can awaken in a man with raw fibers. It was the morning of the first day. And at the end, he says, I smiled with a smile, which penetrated my whole being, like the sun. Well, here is this dramatic, seemingly great transformation. And so, what's the reference here? To anybody who knows much philosophy, this is really, you might say, Murdoch's main inspiration. The idea of Plato's cave. Plato in the Republic tells the allegory of the cave. And what we see here is a nice version of that allegory. In fact, Murdoch's philosophical position is really kind of a Platonism. And so Plato is for me. And here is that platonic theme shining through. In Plato, it appears this way. Actually, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, this is actually how he describes it, but I've got a nice little picture. Yes, good one. But there's a the picture. <laughs> okay, so we've got these people in the back who have a fire lit, and then they're bringing certain shapes in front of that. But these prisoners are chained, and they're just looking at the shadows of the wall. And they think those are the realities. Now, you might think, look, <laughs> all of this is pretty weird, except he's describing a movie theater. Imagine that you're in a movie theater. You've been there your whole life. You're chained to the scene. You can do nothing but look at the screen. You think the reality is actually up there on the screen, when in fact it's being projected from behind. And there are real people and real objects back there projecting these mere images, these mere shadows, onto the screen. Well, you would have no idea what was real. You would think, oh, that stuff was real, when the true realities were there behind you. And so here's the broad idea behind that allegory. Philosophy, Plato was saying, tries to turn people away from those shadows toward the true realities. Now, it's hard to get beyond the appearances to the realities. And in fact, the prisoners released from that cave will at first be stunned. They'll open the door, just as you do when you come out of a dark movie theater. You see the light. It's like blinding. And it's difficult, somewhat painful. And at first, you just have to look at the shadows. But then you can look at the objects. And maybe, eventually, you get to the point where you could actually look up and see the sun itself. Well, that's precisely what we do. The philosopher here in meditation in the cave starts seeing the true reality and walks up out of the cave. Well, I'm not going to go through all of the details here, but this is something like a journey up into this intellectual world toward the truth. And now, here's Socrates describing this. My opinion is that in the world of knowledge, the idea of the good appears at last and is seen only the better. When soon seen as seemingly the universal author of all things, beautiful and right, the parent of light and warm light of the visible world, the source of reason and truth in the intellectual world. And so the good is there calling us from outside. It is like a magnet. And what links us to it? What is the force through which it attracts us? Love. So in the end, we really get this picture of, well, the sun. <laughs> okay, that's what it is in Plato's metaphor, the good. The good is something existing outside us. And so Murdoch's view here is that throughout the novel, Jake acts as something of an existentialist. He lives without appeal. He thinks that Hugo is living without appeal. In either case, they're really getting any better. So their lives are filled with sort of meaningless projects, arbitrary decisions, seemingly irrational decisions. And then finally, there's something outside. And he realizes there is value outside of me. There are things that have their own independent existence outside of me that really are sources of value. Like Anna herself, for example, or the other people in the novel. Or, like, well, his true calling, his true destiny, right? And so he starts realizing, yes, I could do better. And that's precisely the idea. This calls him to do better. And if love is possible, it's really because you realize there is something outside of you that is of value.